All right, Dr. Stephen Green, the success doctor, coming at you with another Make the Grade podcast, and today is going to be a really good one. Uh, as you know, listenership people, I love to bring in experts out there in the field. I got a really good one today. I think you're going to really I have an interest in what he's going to talk about. Um, so get your notebooks, get your listening gear in place. The always goal, goal forever in this podcast is to try to give you the parents, you the students, some actions you can take to maximize your education. So my guest today is uh, Marty Franklin. Marty, welcome. Thank you. And a uh, little, little history, Marty Martin E. Franklin, PhD, a nationally renowned expert in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, OCD spectrum disorders and body focused repetitive behaviors, as well as the study of treatment of anxiety and related conditions. Dr. Franklin, Associate Professor Emeritus of Clinical Psychology in Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. And he's been honored for teaching excellence. Dr. Franklin also serves the clinical director of the Rogers Behavioral Health Philadelphia location. So quite a pedigree. Yeah. Well, when you've been out here a long time. Yeah. Get to go everybody else, everybody else, it's like me. Everybody else retired. So I, I finally got a good exactly. job. Um, so let, let's, let's start with this. Uh, you know, you're, you're a, a, a therapist, right? So yep. what's your typical age-wise or uh, maybe econo socioeconomic, what's your sort of, is there a typical family or a typical case that you serve before we get into some of the nitty gritty? Yeah, and I, I'm in two different places. I'm in, I'm in an outpatient uh, clinic uh, one day a week and then here full-time pretty much at Rogers. And I'd say those differ somewhat. Um, at Rogers here, uh, we're, we're taking kids at a higher level of care and I would say customarily those kids, probably 60% of them are local. We, we see 30 to 40% or so from outside the region. Hmm. And we do in, intensive treatment. So it's basically uh, for partial hospitalization, it's six hours a day for about six weeks. For intensive outpatient, we drop them down to three hours a day for usually two to three weeks. And in my other setting, I, I'm usually seeing people weekly and I would say we run the full gamut age-wise um, here. I'd, I'd say, you know, we, we can see kids as young as seven or eight. Um, and mainly, I think we're, we're focused on treating older children and teens here at Rogers. Okay. And at the other setting I'm in, which we call Harbor, uh, which used to be Cottage when we were all at Penn. At Harbor, it, it, it's a private practice. And I'd say we, we run actually three, four years old. We see some kids even that young, and then we run all the way out through adulthood as well. Hmm. With, with focusing mainly on anxiety and related conditions, we all have expertise in obsessive compulsive disorder. Here at Rogers, we also treat uh, depression. And okay. that depression recovery program is, runs ages 12 to 17. For the, um, for the parents who may not, uh, you know, the whole spectrum of of, of clinical disorders, where, where, where does OCD fall? Is, is that uh, diagnosed, or maybe that's, that's not the right word. In, in court of a categorization, you have sort of the attention issues, right? Uh, like the ADHD sort of thing. Where, 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 where does this fall in kind of the whole yeah. piece? OCD, un, until the DSM-5 came out, was categorized as an anxiety disorder. Okay, and, subset, and, and, yeah. In DSM-5, it actually got its own separate standing, uh, so OCD and related condition. And so OCD, um, and, and what's interesting about OCD is, is you can certainly see pieces of it, some kind of subclinical symptoms in folks who don't have a full diagnosis. But to get a diagnosis of OCD means that your symptoms are causing functional impairment, enough to matter, enough to be in the way. Um, as opposed to occasional worries or occasional repetitive behavior. We, we don't pay a lot of attention to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't customarily see people who are mild. I'm seeing people who are already impaired, sometimes very impaired. Uh, but some of the things that we, we might see in, in, in worries about testing, we, we also, I would expect to see some of that in most kids. Most kids mm -hmm. are going to be 
anxious about tests at least a little bit. And then the question is who's more anxious and then the point to the point where who's so anxious they can't take the tests. Right, Those kids means. wind up getting a diagnosis often, not always OCD, but sometimes a generalized anxiety disorder and those kinds of things then require some more formal uh, interventions than you might try with a kid who's milder and is just worried about one particular test. So I'm, I'm coming from the mindset uh, of a parent who might have a child who let, and this is a story I hear a lot. So my kid studies, they go to a tutor maybe, or they, you know, I quiz them. I, I, we feel like we got a handle on the situation. They go into the test. They don't do well. They freeze. Uh, they, these are not clinical terms. <laughs> uh, you know, they, 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 they get stuck. Um, yeah. Do they have test anxiety? So now let, let's talk about this. So it, 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 what are the causative factors? Is, is it just school? Is the pressure of getting into the right college? Is yeah. it parents putting pressure on kids? Is it peer to peer? Uh, where, where do you think about this? What, what would you say is a, of the laundry list of causes? Where, where do you sort them? <laughs> And I think it's important to distinguish. Or, or I'm sorry, or is, it, or is it organic or is it a combination? Uh, probably all of it. And, and, and okay. so my sense first is it's important for me to know if a kid doesn't do well on a test, is it because they don't understand the material? And so for the kid who, who's studying and doing fine, do well on practice tests and then bombs the actual test, that, that makes me wonder if the freezing is anxiety driven or is the freezing simply a function of having run into material I didn't study? So I want to differentiate those things first. Mm -hmm. Once I identify that I've got a kid who knows the material, who doesn't have any undiagnosed or diagnosed learning problems that will interfere with performance, so it really looks like the anxiety is, is the thing driving the problems, um, I, I want to be pretty careful in those circumstances to start asking important questions about what is it that happened? So, so when you're talking about freezing, I want to know more specifically what it is the kid experienced, what it is that the kid um, uh, started to get uh, stuck on. And I want to see if I can understand that from the perspective of is, is, this a, is this a knowledge issue or is this an anxiety issue? So once, once I can kind of mm -hmm. pass through that, for the kids who are super concerned about their test performances, in terms of which kids are vulnerable, the first thing I would say is if you have anxiety in your family, I mean, we could talk about this as genetic or we could talk about it as learning, it's probably a mix. Mm -hmm. If you have anxiety in your family, you might be more likely to experience that sort of pressure about testing. And it's not a guarantee, it's not like eye color, but you're more vulnerable than, than the kid who doesn't have anybody in that family who worries about this. I also think that we are, especially in higher SES groups, we're becoming more and more concerned about which college they go to, We're becoming more and more concerned about your GPA and your class rank and all sorts of things, this sort of competitive stuff that leads, I think, so sometimes people are worried that if you don't have a certain profile, you have no chance of getting into the elite schools. And for some reason, we decided that the elite schools are the only places worth going <laughs> as a society and, 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 and certainly parents contribute. Mm -hmm. And I think parents and school and society, they all can, they all contribute to that. And so if I've got a kid who's already vulnerable and I have a school system that's saying that basically, you know, if you don't go to an Ivy league school, we don't want to look at you. And you got parents who have the same vulnerabilities. Yeah. You created a soup right? together in that soup. And I, and I may have a kid who were, and, and, and a lot of times anxiety comes down to this. The, the first thing is, and, and social anxiety especially, which could overlap with test anxiety. First thing that folks with social anxiety will tell you is it's terribly important for me to do well. And the second thing they'll tell you is that I don't think I can. So if you think it's important to do well and you don't think you can, you, you're, you're in a pretty vulnerable spot for being anxious. Hmm. If, you, if you apply that to if you apply that to social situations, you, you can see where someone would be is, social. Um, is it? I mean, I could see an adult probably having some level of coping mechanism for this, but but I think this would be scary in a ten, twelve year old. Oh, for sure. Uh, and and probably as a teenager. Um, 
is uh, so so I think to sum up what you said, there's a nature and a nurture piece to this, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's an organic side and maybe a, a little bit of a disposition based on your family history right. or, your, or your family environment. If you got yep. super yep. type A expectations, the, the their environment is going to play a role too. Society is playing a role. No question. Um, how about how much pressure the kids put is they put on themselves? Some kids yeah. don't. Some kids are like, eh, whatever. Some kids are just super driven. Right. And and some kids, it's, it's interesting to see because you, you do occasionally run into a kid whose parents seem to be pretty relaxed about it and, and is the kid putting pressure on themselves. And those kids, I'm, I'm very interested in what they think is going to happen if they don't do well. I start to drill down a little bit on what their thinking is. And, and sometimes they have unrealistic expectations of what it's going to take to get into a decent school. And sometimes they have unrealistic expectations for, for it, if I don't get into these particular schools, my, my life is going to be um, uh, negatively affected. And, and, and we have to challenge some of that as a society. We have to challenge that as parents. I, I think there's nothing wrong with ambition. No. At the same time, if ambition is, is driving your kid to have stomach aches before every exam, I have to start asking if, if my messaging is the best match for my kid's style, temperament. Well, I, I would think it's not, I mean, we're focusing a little bit, at least right now, on test anxiety because that's a common yeah. c complaint uh, in, in the academic side, in the tutoring side, and from a treatment side, it's, it's identifiable, right? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, from the OCD piece, I see some kids come over to my office and their homework is just absolutely pristine. Be I mean, if they if they make an O and it isn't like a completely perfect circle, yeah. they erase it and do it again. And I think that's kind of a manifestation of the same thing. I see kids because of the compulsiveness spending 45 minutes doing homework that might otherwise take them 15 yeah. because they're so concerned about the penmanship uh, or, or you know, it, it being, you know, exactly the margins on the side of the paper. Yep. Um, and I, I, I know that this is one of these things where you can't separate one single thing out, right? It's always right. tied to the web of causative and things like that. Sure. Um, I'm a parent. I see a kid. I'm like, I'm happy my kid's driven. I'm mm -hmm. happy my kid's motivated. I'm happy my kid's not getting in trouble with a bunch of bad kids. Yeah. But, but where, where did... What's what's what, what where, where's the line get crossed? Where does a parent say, you know what, this is this is too much. This is this is harmful or this is unhealthy. Maybe that's a better word choice. And, um, and I, I think it often comes down to how well your kid functions. And I also I try to get parents to pay some attention to how broad the kid's life is, because your kid is is spending all all day Saturday, all day Sunday, every week doing nothing but academics, not going out, not seeing friends, not being involved in sports. not being lack, A lack of balance. Right, that, they, that this is exclusively their job. I start to wonder if, they're, if the messages about how they have to do, if those messages are, are getting distorted. But I want my kids to be balanced. I don't want my kids to be so you know, perfect in one spot and not in another. And so I'm paying a lot of attention to what they're doing outside of school. I'm paying attention to exactly what you said. If a worksheet took you 45 minutes, it should have taken 10. I'm interested in why. And for some kids, it's what, exactly what you said. It's, 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 the, it's the physical depiction, the letters being perfect. For other kids, it's more like, what's the teacher going to think if I don't put in full effort? So, so those questions have different answers, and, and, and I think they can lead you to, to make, uh, for, I'll give you an example. So if I'm treating perfectionism OCD and I've got a kid who's all about the perfect, right, writing out perfectly, my practices, my exposures with this kid are gonna involve making small mistakes on their paper and turning it in anyway. And I may start with just doing it in my office and having them hand it to me mm -hmm. and put it in a shredder, just getting them used to the idea they can, they can tolerate, they can survive, having done something that was imperfect. Then I start to move it up to um, handing it in imperfectly. And sometimes it's handing it in imperfectly as in how it looks. But for some kids, it's, that's not the issue. The issue is, is how it sounds, like, like is it correct? Is it, is it thorough enough? 
Mm. And for some of those kids, I might have them giving in essays where they said to write six, you know, at, at least six sentences. I want them to write five and practice doing it wrong. Because the reality is if, if I hand in a homework sheet and it's not exactly perfect and I get downgraded on homework, the reality is just looking at, at what percent any individual homework assignment is going to contribute to your overall grade, it's pretty minimal. So I want you to learn how to take risks. I want you to learn how to do things faster. Or safe like, risks. Precisely. Right, and, right. And, and, and I think these are certainly under the broad umbrella of safe risks. And if someone tells me that doing imperfectly on an exam is not a safe risk, especially if that person is a parent, then we need to have that conversation. Right. So, we're not going to overcome that if we don't have everybody on the same page. So there are sort of internal expectations, you know, what the person is driving. Then there's external ones that they may or may not uh, put weight on to. No, I, the strat, you know, what it reminds me of when I was uh, – my graduate works in educational psychology, which is a little lighter weight than what you're doing. But I remember the classic thing, somebody's afraid to snakes, right? Yeah. So you don't bring a boa constrictor in the room. No. <laughs> you show them a picture of a little tiny baby snake and you let them and hold the, the person put the picture in front of them, then you let them hold it. And yeah. there's a, there's a series of things that sort of build up a, a, a tolerance in a sense. Right. Um, That's exactly right. I mean, there's, you know, it's interesting because I was, uh, there's this like so-called happiness quotient, right? I, I don't know how plugged in you are to that side of the psychology, you know, sort of humanist piece that if yeah, that even so exists, what? kind of out there still, you know, psychology and kind of things. Come in. The pen has done a lot of work on, on these sorts of things on resilience. So I, I mean, you could, you could beg the question if a kid is happy having what maybe a, a, a clinician would consider aberrant behavior or abnormal or outside of the, you know, the box and whisker chart, isn't that okay? But, but I think what you said, that's, that's the exact counter argument is if it's getting in the way of the rest of their life. Right. 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 So a kid who, who says that this is what I want to do with my seven hours after school. And, and I, I, and they might feel perfectly happy with that and they're getting good grades. The system is reinforcing them for it. Their, their mm -hmm. question might be, what's the problem? Am I, right. I'm, well, that's I'm not, what I'm saying, right? I'm, I'm not spraying graffiti <laughs> on, on, on subway platforms. Like, wh why are you on me about this? And the answer would be because this is not sustainable. You can, in the long run, continue with this level of effort because as you go up in education, you're going to have more demands. You're going to have harder work. You're going to have other things you need to do. And if, if it takes you, you know, like six hours to do something that should take two, that's four hours now that's taken away from things you're going to be asked to do later. And, and so what you do in sixth grade with your worksheets may, may or may not be, you might not feel it as an issue, but when you get to 12th grade and you have eight classes and you have worksheets mm -hmm. in all of them, you do the math. You don't have 56 hours to do all that. From a, from a clinical treatment standpoint, uh, is it easier to treat, uh, you don't use the word cure, but is it easier right. to treat this in, let's say, a 10-year-old than a 15-year-old than a 20-year-old because the habits are that much more ingrained? Yeah. I, so you I want to catch it as early as you can. I think there is some evidence that, that, that catching it earlier does make it easier and, and, and those treatment gains are usually more durable. Well, sometimes it, what, what it might be is, is if you catch it early enough, you don't see the development of secondary anxiety disorders or, or comorbid depression. So the mm -hmm. earlier I catch it, may, maybe maybe I'm I'm changing the trajectory for that kid. So and and teaching them some strategies and and my strategy and we talk about coping strategies all the time. The most important coping strategy for anxiety is leaning into it instead of away. Avoidance is the biggest problem. And so if you have somebody who gets worried about an exam and they're so overwhelmed they don't study for it, now they start yeah. to cram and it becomes now a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and, and and indeed you're going to wind up having a sense that you don't master the information and then the test might come out and prove that what's what's interesting is those kids will then double down on the same strategy and and that the strategy wasn't working before we need to change it up so as a clinician you obviously have a trained eye right as a parent uh a, a lay person 
for back of a better term, right? Yeah. What, what would a parent, what, what would be a, a, a something a parent could look for, or maybe even a teacher, a parent could ask a yep. teacher to look for that might say, hey, listen, maybe we need to take this to another level, or we need to seek professional right. uh, counsel, even even on a, an entry level. You, right. know, you don't have to go. I, I, I would say I, I would say a few things. I'd say the degree of distress. Okay, so some kids might be worried about the spelling test. The other kid is is throwing up days beforehand. So the level of distress might be part of it. Okay. Another piece of it would be uh, avoidance. So if I have a kid who now won't go to school because they have an exam, or they do they leave in the middle of the exam, or they they move heaven and earth to make sure they don't have to take it that also gets my attention because lots of people could be nervous on exam day, but I'm looking at the subset of kids who who's, are so overwhelmed that they, and, and as you said before, either bomb the test or wind up zoning out or just wind up not even going. So those kinds of things I'm looking for. I'm also with, with teachers in particular, I'm very interested in the kid who comes up at the end of the class and asks you the same question multiple times. <laughs> So the homework is it's page 48 to 49, right? Yes, that's what it says on the sheet. So, so it's 48 to 49, yes? And there's a subset of kids who have ADD where I, I may actually want to reinforce some of this effort because that, that may be their, their attentional issues might lead them to need to be more organized and more thorough about this. Hmm. But the anxious kid who's already got it written down in a, in a homework planner and walks up to you and reads you the you know, I understand you. this is due on Friday. Am I right? Yes. So it's due on Friday? Uh, yes. If I get a <laughs> bunch of those questions in a row, it leads me to think the kid is doing some reassurance seeking. And then I'm going to look in general at, you know, is this a kid who's always stressed out about schools, a person who looks terribly unhappy, you know, bathroom breaks or excuses to leave the room during my test. And I'm looking for those, not just one thing, but, but a constellation of things that lead me to think that the kid's taking this really seriously. And sometimes a kid will tell you, and sometimes mm -hmm. a kid won't tell you, but their behavior will tell you. Especially as so they get older. Hey, uh, by the way, Steve Green, uh, make the great podcast. I'm talking to Dr. Marty Franklin, uh, psychologist, expert in attention, not attention, sorry. Obsessive compulsive disorder. There's my attention issue. Uh, <laughs> um, let me ask you this, because yeah. this I have had this experience in the last three months in my caseload. Uh, a parent had a child who they felt had a, a compulsive issue, mm -hmm. but they were reluctant to get uh, even go to therapists because they were afraid to open the door. They didn't want to go mm -hmm. down the hole. They 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 didn't want to open it a little and find out, you know, it was a lot going on and it was going to be an, a, a protracted treatment. And maybe it was, I, I think they, I think they just didn't want to know anything was actually wrong. Right. Or they were afraid that it was sort of the tip of the iceberg of, of a, a clinical. It, 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 your view on that. And, and I encourage them. I said, listen, it's not your life. This is your child's life. You got to yeah. serve their purpose as number one. Um, but your reaction to that is it something uh, there, there are a variety or? of reasons parents might be reluctant I'd, I'd probably want to explore why in particular this family was reluctant for some people it's like you said they're they're almost afraid of opening up a bigger can of worms well, that's exactly what the parent said to me <laughs> and my re my reaction to that is well that can of worms is going to open itself later so my sense is that we want to catch it now before it's spread out before it's kind of it's it's more of a a broader issue. So, so early intervention is really important. So even if a kid's got relatively mild symptoms, I'd rather catch it and teach the kid how to address it rather than leave it be and to have a kid come back. Because you see this a lot in, in OCD around academics, which is the kid is the best student in the class, the best student in the class, the best student in the class, best student in the class, in the class not in the class. Mm -hmm. And because because they reach this point where they recognize it's not sustainable, and their methods of, of avoidant coping aren't working anymore. If they have active compulsions, the checking is not working anymore. And I think if I catch it when they're in fifth grade, I feel like I have a better chance to sort it out than if I catch it when they're 24. So the message to the parents is this should be investigated. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely and right. Probably not much harm in, in, in looking at it and seeing that the kid's just having a, a tough stretch or doesn't get geometry, in which case we can address right. that via educational intervention. Right. Yes. As opposed to this isn't about geometry, this is about the threat of being evaluated and the threat of not doing well. And that your kid is is taking that and running with it and, and, and doesn't have a way to slow that down. Here's here's maybe a tough one for you. Um, sometimes I'll see situations, uh, and to be really up blunt, um, where the kid just doesn't have the chops. Right. I mean, so not everybody's going to be a straight A student, no. despite all the support, you know, whatever. But they're the parents' expectations. You're going to. Yeah, you and Maya, your mother and I did this, and we were straight A students, and that's definitely fallen into the family environment. Um, but but at, at what point is it just a reality that the expectation, if whether it's the child's expectation or the parent's expectation or some external expectation, the the child just cannot fulfill it. They just don't have right. uh, the the intellect, maybe, or right. the, or the drive, or both. Yeah. And I Ooh, see this not. Right. I see this not just in academics. I see this with kids who are like, you know, really in these high level travel sports programs. Oh yeah. Uh, where you know, their whole goal is basically to excel enough to get college uh, support scholarships and so on. So this is not limited to academics, but I think it's a no. similar, a similar phenomenon, but yep. uh, you know, it's a tough conversation to have with a parent. Yes, it is. You know, it's like when I was when I was teaching, one of my roles was uh, I had to do evaluations to see what we get accepted into gifted programs. Well, at least once a year, there was somebody that just didn't have it. I mean, I, right. I, there's really no kinder way to say it, right? Yeah. And you know, yeah, your kid's bright and your kid's smart, and but uh, the way gifted is defined, at least in the school district I was in, they weren't over the line. Right. What do you mean my kid's not gifted? <laughs> You're telling me my kid's not gifted? Who are you to tell me my kid's not gifted? I mean, they're ready to punch you. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I'm, you know. I'm happy to absorb those blows in, in, in the spirit <laughs> of uh, not reinforcing this idea that you're either gifted or you're nothing. Also finding out what the kid is good at, what the kid likes to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so it's what you said before, which is, is who, whose life is this anyway? Well, that was a yeah. play back in the 70s, Richard Dreyfuss. <laughs> Ah. And, 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 I, and I think that it was, um, it's, well, it's well thought through, like, like wh what am I doing this for? And if my kid, if I'm dragging my kid to yet another tournament to get him a look at some, you know, I'm going to Colorado for a softball tournament, and I live in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, and the kid is, is reluctant to go, doesn't want to go, it's like, I have to ask myself, well, who is this for? And those are difficult questions for parents because pa most parents are going to say, oh, I'm doing this for my kid. Yeah, but somehow we, on a we, level, we, right. A kid who's saying, I but I don't really want to do this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I've got to get parents to recognize, and, and this is where some of that fear comes from, is that just because your kid doesn't go to Stanford doesn't mean they're going to be living in a refrigerator box in Center City. <laughs> there are other people who don't go to Stanford and places like it I'm perfectly they, happy. It work out just fine, and it's, and I'm willing to say that to parents, and as 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 a large part to advocate for the kid, and there are other kids who who say it's it's my it's my dream in life to go to one of these schools, and the reason it is is because I see this program is a good match to what I want to do professionally. Godspeed, kid. Recognize that you you you're going to add some stress because of that. And you're going to need to find ways to manage that and ways to make sure that you're not, you know, trying to get a 4.2 and a 4.0 system. Mm -hmm. and, and almost like you got, you got to give them some awareness of what this path is going to look like. But if it's driven by the kid, I'm, I'm more inclined to think, let, let's find a way to support this kid in doing this. Unless it be, unless it's seven hours of homework for, a, for what should take. Which is a, a very sane sort of holistic way to look at this. Yeah. Um, let, let, let's, let's, let's do this. It, ha, just simple. Th, I, this is not intended to replace therapy. Um, but what are some things a, a parent could do or parents could do to help support kids? Maybe these are tools you're uh, teaching kids in, in a therapy uh, outpatient kind of environment. 
uh, especially if it's a mild, maybe a subclinical kind of level, right. uh, you know, right. is there stuff, you know, kind of, you know, e sort of home remedies, so to speak, right. that we can and, throw and in. I would, I would say there, certainly the, your own messaging will be important. I also try, when it, and I'm, I'm a parent too, I, I tried as much as I could to point out my own foibles and mistakes when I was their age, my own foibles and mistakes now. <laughs> that didn't um, work I, with me in my case. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so I don't, I don't put myself forth as being perfect. I'm, I wouldn't work anyway. <laughs> but I also try to intentionally, like, I, I, I'll bring up stories that are funny of me misunderstanding a word or misspelling a word to basically model this idea that I'm not perfect and I don't expect you to be either. Then your response to when they do well but not perfectly is a, is a, is a very important. So a kid comes back with an 89 on a tough test. Like, my question then is, what, what did you say, what, both verbally and nonverbally? And, and I'm, my first question, you know, I, I jokingly refer to a lot of parents in our, in our region as having B phobias. And I don't mean the bug. <laughs> you mean the grade. A is a good grade. <laughs> a B yeah. is a good grade. Okay? So I try to recalibrate that. And, and as a parent, that's what I, I want to make sure that I, I don't give the disappointed look. You know, I, I'm, I'm guess, I guess you're not going to amount to anything when they come in with an 84. I mean, if they come in with an 84 and they say this is uh, – this was the hardest test we ever took. Mm -hmm. I mean, class average was a 69. I have a different reaction. But if they come in with an 84 and it's clear they were mailing it in, I have, I have to ask myself, is, is there a way that you think, you, does it matter to you that you got an 84? And if the kid's like, well, yeah, it, it's kind of disappointing. And then, then I'll, fair enough, I, I, instead of admonishing the kid, I'm like, I wonder what you could do to, to, to make that a little bit better. Like, what, what could you do? So, so the, 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 the advice here, of at least one thing, is, is just to be reasonable right. and realistic, right? As a right. parent, as a mentor. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, or, or to use humor. My, my father, who was, a, was an Irish immigrant, eighth grade education, comes here to raise his family because he thought we had more opportunities. here. And my mother was sort of a driven person who was more on, on the academic side. And I remember one day I, I bring home a test. And my dad, my mother wasn't around. So my, my dad was home and, and he, I, I need him to sign the test. This is eighth grade or so. He picks <laughs> up the test, he looks at it, and I got a 97. And he looks at the test through his very thick lenses. And he, in his Irish brogue, he says, what happened to the other three points? <laughs> my response was, I know where he's going. My response was, I got those questions wrong on purpose simply <laughs> to torture you. <laughs> and he smiles, he goes, that's me boy. And he signs the test. So we, we had, a, there's a humor about it. So he, he recognized I didn't get a hundred. He also recognized, I think he was recognizing that a 97 is a pretty darn good grade. And so there was, there was that sort of rapport about like, do as, do as well as you can. And at the same time, no one's going to, no one's going to rake you over the coals about getting a 97 or an, even an 87. And we were good students, but we, we weren't we weren't subjected to that sort of, oh my God, you're you're never going to get into Harvard. Like my parents were immigrants. I don't even know if they knew what, what Harvard was, which actually actually put us in a different position, and that we had to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And then it, then much of the academic drive was coming from us, not from them. They just wanted us to do well and be good people and get jobs and not live in their basement, which all worked out beautifully. <laughs> it. I'm a 15 year old kid. I want to try to self monitor this. I don't want, I want, I want my parents on my back. Yeah. I don't want some, it's like a uh, goodwill hunting, right? I don't want some therapist okay. telling me what to do. Um, goodwill hunting. That's the movie, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, Fabulous movie. is there something that speaking to that population that might be listening, you can, you know, maybe throw out a nugget or two to them. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, it's probably in the people, same theme, right? Which is just be realistic, right. but. And, and, and what I tell people all the time at, at 15, at e even younger, but certainly, you know, my, my adult colleagues is what's your goal mm -hmm. and work backwards from your goal. So if your goal is to go to an Ivy league institution and you feel like that's crucial, then that, that sets a certain path. If your goal is to get into a, a college, and pursue an education in some particular area, then work backwards. What are the things that will help me get into a program 
that's about marine biology as opposed to physics. So I, I, I want to kind of get you to start thinking about how those things work. And grades are, are a part of that presentation. Mm -hmm. Like, like if, I'm, if I'm applying to a program that's, oh, like they say, you can't, you can't even apply to this program unless you have a 3.6, fair enough. I need to work towards a 3.6. And I want people to, to set their academic goals, and I also want them to start working backwards from those goals, but I also want them to pay attention to balance and sustainability. Because if, if I have to study 16 hours a day for six months, that's, I'm not, that's not sustainable. I'm no. not going to be able to do that. And nor should anyone expect me. To. Now, the sustainability concept, I think, is really, is really, uh, really wise. Yeah, you're going to burn um, out otherwise. Yeah, I mean, long term for sure. Yeah. Short term probably also. Look, one, one last thing here, and then I'm going to kind of give you the final word. Um, I see a lot of kids that need 25 hours, 26 hours in a day. They're going yeah. to school. They're on a sport, they're in a play, they're in clubs, they're in out of school activities, they're volunteering, they're have jobs, they're taking driver's license tests, whatever. Yeah. That by itself creates pressure. I don't want to use the word anxiety. Right. Um, it's a juggling act, right? Everybody says, yeah. oh, these kids are 20 times more busy than I was when I was growing up. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it's, is, is there any, uh, is, does that environment drive the, the, the anxieties and the, these things as much as anything else? I mean, I know we, I'm kind of circling back to that because I'd taken some notes when we were talking. But I just wanted to ask you because we, we kind of identified internal sort of pressures might lead to this, external ones. And the third one that occurred to me was just this idea of just sheer volume yep. of responsibility, right? Yep. And a lot of times it brings bring it on themselves. You know, they, they want to be in a lot of things, maybe for the same reasons. They want to pad their academic resume or they just want to be involved. But um, in your in your uh, experience, is that a third of the problem? Is it, it depends on the kid? Is it yeah. whatever? Probably depends on the kid. Probably depends on the setting. But what I, what I try to get kids to do is look at their schedules. And I, the first thing I ask them is, is, where's your hour to waste? <laughs> where's your hour to listen to music? I, I listen to music as, as a kid a lot, maybe more than I should have. But wh where's the hour? Like, wh where can you find some place where you, you can just turn it off? Downtime. If I'm looking at your schedule and I don't see any downtime, I, I'm going to try to figure out where to find it. And sometimes they can find it in their academic schedules. So, so if I've got a – just trying to work productively. If I have two study halls during the school day, I want to use some of that time to talk to friends and I want to use some of that time to knock out work that I can so that I'm not up at 11 o'clock at night, 1130 at night, still finishing stuff. I also then ask them, okay, so if, if you're, if you're in 11 clubs, like, let's just think about this from the perspective of the person who's reviewing your college app. If you're in 11 clubs, does that really mean that you're in 11 clubs or does it mean you're trying to pad your resume? Like do things you're passionate about, do things that define you, do things that are interesting to you because mm -hmm. you'll be more of an interesting candidate if you're in three things than if you're in 11. And so, and I'm trying to find you that hour to just listen to somebody that dropped album today. And, and I'd rather you do that than fill it up with needless. Um, just another activity for the yeah. sake of an activity. Right. Because I, I don't think, I don't, in the end, I'm not sure that impresses people as much as the kids think that it might. No, I mean, I can tell you in the amount of college counseling I do, all the admissions people I know would rather see leadership oh, roles yeah. in less things right. than participation in many things. Right, um, right. And, and, and I, I'd like to get kids to, to just really pay some attention to making sure they're restoring themselves. Like sleep is another issue. I mean, some of these kids are up <laughs> And, and, and then they're getting up at six to get ready like that the five and then they will sleep for 15 hours on the weekend that for the, all the sleep hygienists will tell you that's not a fabulous idea no it, it isn't <laughs> that, that's a that's a completely additional I know, that's, that's another podcast isn't it there's a couple of podcasts there's a big uh, push in a lot of school districts to open later and then the argument is I love, well, this I love yeah, that I, I I have mixed feelings but I favor it more than I don't but um, 
Marty Franklin, thank you. I want to give you anything we didn't cover. You want to talk about anything you want to plug? You have any uh, oh, specialization in your practice you want to sure. share I mean, with I, everyone? I did have a book come out last year. Okay. Uh, published by Gilbert Press. It, it, it's Franklin, Freeman, and March. And the title is Treating OCD in Children and Adolescents, a Cognitive Behavioral Approach. And within that book, the reason I think it's of some relevance is we do see a fair amount of perfectionism in the context of obsessive compulsive disorder. And so the book has, has examples and, and, and even dialogue of how you would interact with a family and interact with a kid around making these mistakes, moving faster, you know, kind of consolidating their work so that they're not overwhelmed. So I think that might be of some relevance. We, Can we you give the title practice. again? Give the title oh, yeah. again. Uh, 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 treating, OCD. treating OCD in children and adolescents, a cognitive behavioral approach. Guilford Press. Came out in 2019. Uh, I will put that in the show notes for those of you who are interested. Um, so you are you are a best-selling author. Well, we're <laughs> out there. I, I did a number of book signings, which was which was fun around the country. Well, I, I I have I have a book. Uh, this is my book. I I just had it here. But oh, uh, excellent. Yeah, but this this was a bestseller in the education category, which uh, for like eleven weeks in a row. What they don't tell you is there's only four other books. Oh, yeah, in the category. I, I, don't, I don't even ask those questions. Yeah, it's right. If you're double I'm digit sales, you're doing pretty well in education. I'm just trying to give therapists a resource to use if they decide they want to try some of this cognitive behavioral stuff if they're not expert at it themselves. If um, let me ask you this, really more as a parent. Yeah, I really am impressed with your, uh, you, you, what I'm going to call holistic approach. Maybe you wouldn't call it that, but I think you're looking at the whole kid, the whole child. Right, yeah. I, I, I've got a strong sense that you're putting the child first, uh, which, I, which I applaud. And I believe I do the same thing in my academic uh, side of things. Um, it, is, is that, uh, it, not everybody's going to be able to come to see you, right? Especially if they're listening to this in California or Texas or right. where a lot of places. Is is your approach, would you, would you say this is consistent among therapists that treat what you do? Is there a broad kind of differentiation of different approaches? I would or? say cognitive behavioral therapists with expertise in anxiety would probably be saying very much what I'm saying. Okay. And we're, we're very much present centered. I don't, I don't care what, what you're doing seven years ago. I care about what's happening now. I'm very interested in avoidance behavior. I'm very interested in repetitive behavior because those, those things may be digging the hole deeper that you're trying to get out of. And I'm very interested in family environment and, and school environment and what contributions they make. And also, can we modify those contributions like we were saying before? having mm -hmm. a different way of, of expressing that you're proud of your kid. And at the same time, if you think your kid's not putting in a maximum effort to talk about that in, in, in a way that's convergent with the kid's own goals, as opposed to, you know, you, you're, you're ruining our family and now you'll, now you'll never get into darkness. <laughs> but at some point, and it was funny is because mo most kids who are not anxious would dismiss that out of hand and say, that's a ridiculous thing to be saying. But that's but the kids are more vulnerable to that message. Right, right. They're they're sort of on the edge of the cliff, so to speak. Right, and yeah. anything like that is another push in in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. so if I if I know my kids' temperament well enough to realize that they get dialed up quickly about these sorts of things, and I want to be dialing it down. Another thing, I, uh, this is this is from a book that I read maybe fifteen years ago. Gary Nessner who interestingly enough was, was one of the FBI's chief hostage negotiators. Hmm. He wrote a book about maybe 20 years ago called Stalling for Time. And basically it was about how to, how to negotiate with people who've taken hostages. And, he, and he's been at many of the famous scenes in the last you know, 30 years. And what Nestor's book, 250 pages or so, what it essentially says is this. When people are escalating, you should probably consider de-escalate. So if my kid comes in and they're upset about a test, the last thing in the world I want to do is join them in that. Either fight with them about it or say, oh my God, it is unfair. This now you is want to defuse. Right. I, I, want to, I want to step it down. Mm -hmm. so I want to say, well, let, let's think about this a minute. There's another book, which is, which is I'm throwing books out here, Anne Lamott. So Anne Lamott is a writer. 
and she wrote a book on writing and the name of the book was Bird by Bird. And so, and, and the introductory part of Bird by Bird is Anne Lamott is a 10 year old who gets an assignment in school that she has to do a, a paragraph about the various birds they've been studying in their, in their school. And Anne Lamott is an anxious person. She comes home, she's 10, and she's crying her eyes out. And her dad, who seemed like a pretty low key guy, who's probably good at what we're talking about. She comes in, she's bawling her eyes out, and he says, and he, her nickname for him was Pumpkin. He goes, what's going on, Pumpkin, what's wrong? And she starts spewing that she has to do I have to do an entire paragraph on these 30 birds. I don't know how we're going to start. I don't know how we're going to get through it. And the dad just sat her down. I said, I know exactly how we're going to do it. Well, we're out of time. He says, he, he waits. He says, we're going to do it bird by bird. Which he helps her break the task down. And he doesn't get sucked into the idea this is too much for her to do. Right, and he right. works with her. And next thing you know, I've got a task, instead of thinking about, oh my God, I have to write about 30 birds, I write about the blue jay. And then you move then on to the cardinal, the cardinal, and then right in the Then sheet. I got the robin, now I got the oriole. Yeah. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through it, and I don't feel overwhelmed anymore, because I was able to break it down. So his role as a parent was to dial her down, and he did it beautifully. It's, it's so, there's so much, it's like just basic human psychology in this stuff, you yeah. know? It, yeah. When you were saying the thing, first of all, the fact that the guy could write 200 pages about negotiations yeah. <laughs> kind of amazes me to begin with. But it has interesting stories. It, it reminds me almost like the disc analysis, if you know what that is. It's taught a lot. In, well, it's, it's a little dated now, but it's taught a lot in sales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got like an intellectual person. You, you talk to them intellectually. You got an emotional right. person. You talk to them emotionally. Yeah. Magic, right. Um, all right. Uh, so you got a book. This is excellent. Uh, this is, uh, you know, just some really interesting stuff. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up and just, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about or, or just closing? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think the, the first pass is always going to be the parent and the teacher together, maybe the school yeah. counselor trying to help a kid who looks like they're having trouble. If I see that the problems are persisting or worsening, I may want to reach out, find myself a cognitive behavioral therapist. Anxiety Disorder Association of America, the International OC Foundation will help that happen. They have, they have listings of, of trained therapists. And then if I get myself to a therapist that I start doing weekly and that's not enough, because the kid's functionally impaired, not, stops going to school, then we do have some options for higher level of care, which is at Rogers, what we're doing locally. But Rogers, we have, we have 12 sites around the country. So we now have in, in a position where we can help people do more intensive treatments if they need them. And, and the people who need them are the ones who didn't respond to the lower level of care and the ones who, who are getting mm -hmm. functionally impaired still or getting worse because, because an hour a week is not enough for some There's, um, It reminds me, I'm not positioning myself as a comedian, <laughs> but it reminds yeah. me of a joke. You could, you could apply this to any, they apply it to tutoring too sometimes, but the guy, a, a person goes to a, a therapist or a tutor, you fill in the mm -hmm. blank. And they're laying on the couch and they're, they're getting treatment and the guy says, you know, doctor, I gotta ask you, when am I gonna get better? I've been coming to you for 10 years and we talk and this and this, and I don't know if I'm getting any better or not. And the doctor, the tutor, whatever you wanna say says, oh, that's easy, you'll get better when you can't afford to pay me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, a little dark. And well, what, I, what I would say there is is that cognitive behavior therapy shouldn't. It's usually thought well, of as relative. What, what, what the the message I get from that is there's really two things. A person has to want to improve. Sure. Oh, right. Yeah. You could give somebody a hundred tools if they don't use them. Yeah. Um, and right. I think I think when you get the a good clinician with the right tools and can put them in place in, in the right way. Uh, you can, I've seen, you know, kids I've seen in some of these therapies make really fast yeah. progress Me and too. it stick. More importantly, it sticks. Right. It's about durability. Yep. That's really the key. So, all right, listen, uh, Steve Green here, Dr. Stephen Green with Dr. Marty Franklin. We got a, we got a PhD convention here. Oh, and, thank you so um, much for having me on. Marty is local to me in the Philadelphia area, but I, I uh, will put all his information in the show notes if you 
he's willing to uh, accept emails or something if you have any questions. Uh, the podcast here is always about trying to give you parents and students actions you can take to help further your education. And what we talked about today, I think, is really a really interesting subtext. It's a broad issue on a lot of levels of severity, and hopefully this was valuable for everyone. So, Marty, thanks again. Sure. And uh, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them below in the comment area, and we will see you next time. So long. Let me stop the recording.